But in the prison camp, I had my ultimate, I think, seminal experience that changed my character. One of the things you had that happens to you when you first go into prison camp is you, you, you lose any sense of having control over your own life. You sort of surrender yourself to knowing that you no longer have any ability to control what goes on. You can't decide what to eat, you can't decide what to do, lights go out, you can't go away. And so you sort of end up with this feeling of helplessness and surrender. But there was a guy in the second camp who was older than me. I mean, he, was, he looked very old to me, he was 28. And he sort of adopted me. And one day he said to me, I want you to wash your, I want you to shave and wash your socks. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, but there was one razor for 240 men. You can imagine the blade. There was no shaving cream. There was no hot water. There was an outhouse with cold water, and this is January, very cold. And to wash your socks meant you had to wash them in this outhouse in cold water with just practically no soap. And I did. I took the razor, and I took my socks. It probably took me 20 minutes to shave, and every time I cut a follicle, it brought tears to my eyes. But I did it. And then I washed my socks and brought them in and put them on the little belly stove we had that was the only source of heat in the barracks. But what I did symbolically that moment was to take back control of my own life. Uh, I sort of was back in charge now. And I helped organize lecture circuits. And at night, the French had rigged up a radio. They were there five years, so they had managed to rig up a radio. And they got, the, they, they got all the bulletins every night, what was going on in the fronts. And the French men would come to a corner where we intersected, and one of our guys who could speak French would orally get the information, memorize it. Then one from each of the four American barracks, I was, my, I was the newscaster from my barracks, would meet and memorize the bulletins. And then at night, when lights were out, we stationed guys at each door, and I would stand up and I would give the news of the day. Toward the end of the war, when the Russians were getting near Berlin, they stopped at the Oder River for, to retrench and resupply. So for two weeks, when I got to the Eastern Front, they were still there every night where we had left them the night before. And one night, the guys started yelling at me. That's where they were, they said, last night. You know what? And I said, and I yelled at them, if you don't like it, get somebody else to do this. You know, it was, it was that kind of a thing. But um, finally, we knew the end was coming because we could hear core guns coming closer. And, and then the Germans told us we were to be moved out. They were moving everybody to the camp, going eastward away from the front. They didn't want us to be liberated. And we knew that that was going to be sort of fatal if we did that because we were in no condition to really do long hikes. The, the American planes were shooting up everything that was moving on the roads. They couldn't tell from the air that we were not German troops, that we were... American POWs. So that night we spent organizing ourselves into one third of the group was going to stay in their bunks and say we're too ill to move. The other group was to fall down into the mud, it was a cold wet rain, and say we're too, when they wanted to move aside, say we can't move. And the third group that was finally moved was to jump the guards the third night out. I was with the third group. They moved out the Russians, they moved out the French, they moved out the British, they moved out all the other groups. When it came time to our game, the guys stayed in their bunks. Then as they started to try to move us out, our designated POWs started dropping in the mud. I mean, it was brilliantly choreographed and carried out. The Germans were getting very pissed and shooting guns in the air. We didn't quite know what was going to go on. Finally, they allowed us to go back into our barracks. And the German guards left because they didn't want to be captured. So here we were in the middle of the barracks, nobody else around, all the other German, all the other POWs moved out. And the German army was swarming around us, the defeated German army. And there's nothing more dangerous than a defeated army because it has no discipline. You don't know what they're going to do. So we stayed very quiet. SS came in at one point to rummage around where the Germans had been living so that they could get some food. We stayed very, very quiet then. And then about four o'clock in the afternoon, the tanks came down, the American tanks, or the six armored came down. And about two hours later, the first jeep came in, and I was sitting on the roof by that time with our guys to see this whole thing. 
And when the Jeep came in, the first thing I thought of, it said, actually, my God, they're fat, our, our guys. They're so fat. I hadn't seen, <laughs> we, we were not fat. So the normal people looked fat to us. Then we stayed there for another week and then we repatriated home. And during, while, during the repatriation process, we got the news that Franklin Roosevelt had died. He was the president I grew up with. And so I came home, but I came home changed. I left a skinny, uh, uncertain kid from Brooklyn. And I came home a much different person.